Uh, Edmund Arnold is a dedicated wellness in schools program liaison and wellness coach with the Contra Costa Office of Education. With over 10 years of experience, he has worked extensively with students and families across the country, primarily those who attend Mount McKinley and Golden Gate Community Charter Schools. He has spent the last four years in the Wellness in Schools program, which has allowed him to work with schools to foster an appreciation for the importance of mental wellness and build communities that encourage students to seek out mental health help when needed. Passionate about destigmatizing mental health, Edmund believes education is key to early inter, uh, identification and intervention. Drawing from his own personal experiences managing anxiety and depression, he understands the importance of creating a supportive and understanding environment for all. In this presentation, Edmund will discuss anxiety and school avoidance, along with strategies to support students who may be dealing with the issues at home. Thank you, Janine. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, per perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Edmund Arnold. I'm a wellness and schools program liaison with the Contra Costa Office of Education. I'm very happy to be here with all of you this morning. Uh, as part of my anxiety, when I get nervous, I talk really fast, so I'm going to do my best to slow down, but I'm all, I'll have a lot of information to cover today. So I'm also going to do everything I can to get through it all. Uh, one of the objectives of the Wellness in Schools program is to provide trainings on mental health topics to parents that can help improve awareness and understanding of mental health topics and knowledge of how to navigate mental health services. I'm excited to be here with you all this morning to talk about the important topic of anxiety and school avoidance. Uh, you may have heard this topic called school refusal. I like to say school avoidance, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go on with this presentation. So we have a full agenda today. We will discuss what is mental health. We're going to talk about anxiety symptoms, causes, and triggers. We will discuss school avoidance at a length. We will talk briefly about the importance of attendance and spend a good amount of time on parent strategies and resources that can be useful to combat school avoidance. If you have any questions at any point, please put them in the chat and I'll make sure to get uh, to them during the Q&A portion in the presentation towards the end. So I was one of those students who was always annoying my teachers with the questions of why are we learning this? Why is this important? And when will I use this in my life? I blame my parents for instilling a lot of confidence in me as a young person. That being said, I really wanna stress why this topic is important. Uh, we know that early identification and intervention, addressing these issues early can prevent them from escalating. Early intervention can help children and students develop coping strategies and reduce the long-term impact on their education and mental health. We wanna increase our understanding and support. So by discussing these topics, parents, teachers, and peers can better understand what the child is going through. This understanding fosters a supportive environment, which is essential for the child's well-being. We're all about reducing stigma in Contra Costa Office of Education, and we believe that opening conversations about school anxiety and refusal help reduce the stigma associated with mental health issues. This encourages more children and parents to seek help without feeling ashamed. And we know that addressing these issues improves academic and social outcomes. Addressing school refusal anxiety can improve a child's academic performance and social interactions. It helps them stay engaged in school and build positive relationships with peers and teachers. And finally, we're all about empowering parents. So educating parents about these issues equips them with the knowledge and tools to support their children effectively. This can lead to better outcomes for the child and reduce family stress. So be, before we get started in everything, we're gonna first talk about what mental health is. This is the definition that I give to schools, uh, parents and students when I do this training. Mental health is a person's overall well-being, including, including how they think and feel. It's all about our feelings, thoughts, and emotions. Mental health affects our behaviors. It determines how we act in specific situations. Mental health also determines how we handle stress, relates to others, and make healthy choices. Good mental health is the foundation of a happy, healthy, and productive life. We know that mental health is normal. Everyone experiences up and downs throughout their lives. It's important to understand that these fluctuations of moods are a natural part of life. And we know that mental health is influenced by many factors that includes genetics, environment, and life experiences all play a huge role in your mental health. 
And just like our physical health, this is something we stress a lot. Achieving and maintaining mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood all the way to an adulthood. And then it's very important for teaching our children about mental health. We'll help them focus on school, maintain relationships with those they care about, and they'll be better equipped with skills to overcome the obstacles that they have in life. I'm going to watch, we're gonna watch a quick video that I show to all of our staff and student trainings for mental health awareness. I hope we all can hear this. You can't tell how someone feels just by looking at them or what they share online. To the outside world, our lives may look perfect, even if in reality they aren't. I'm always worrying about doing well at school, and with the end of year test coming up, I'm not sure how much longer I can cope. My thoughts swarm around my head, sometimes keeping me up all night. Some days it's just all too much, and I feel like I'm lost in space. When I did badly on one of my tests, I just about kept it together until I got home. Then I broke down crying in front of my mum. She listened for a bit, and then she told me that, just like physical health, we all have mental health. It's our feelings, our thinking, our emotions and our moods. She then said that feeling down, angry and stressed is a normal part of life. Just like it's normal to feel happy, confident and carefree sometimes. We all have positive and negative emotions that come and go based on what's happening around us. These are everyday feelings. Good mental health means experiencing negative emotions. It's not always about being happy. Mum can relate to the feelings of stress. So when mum suggested I take a break from everything and do something I enjoy, I actually took her advice. So I made myself a hot chocolate, snuggled off in a duvet and watched a film. And you know what? Afterwards I felt so much better. Mum should take her own advice. Most of us only ever share the good things. We don't like to share how we really feel. Every morning when I wake up, negative thoughts stream through my head. Getting out of bed and pretending I'm okay takes all the energy I have. As the day goes on, the negative thoughts turn from a stream into a river. The water rushes through my head so loudly it's hard to concentrate in lessons. And some days it's so bad it feels like a waterfall that's trying to pull me over the edge. Everything is so overwhelming. I didn't think my friends would understand if I told them how down I was feeling. But when Sasha opened up to me about how stressed she was feeling, I told her. I wasn't sure how to bring up how I'd been feeling, so I started by saying that I didn't feel like myself. Just her listening made me feel like she understood. She told me some things that had helped her, so I tried them too. But it didn't make much of a difference. Even when I tried to be around my friends, I felt alone. The things I used to enjoy weren't fun anymore. I was really worried about Andre and not sure what to do. He was quiet and wasn't hanging out with us like he used to. So I asked our head of year for some advice. He suggested I get Andre to speak to him since his negative feelings weren't going away. I didn't want to speak to our head of year, but I also didn't want to keep feeling so down, so I went. He said that sometimes we have overwhelming feelings that can be more intense than our everyday feelings. These feelings hang around for a long time and change the way we feel, think, and behave. They can stop us doing what we want to in life. That's what I was going through. He also said that if we're physically unwell, we let people know, we ask for help. It should be no different with mental health. Sometimes our overwhelming feelings are brought on because of things in our life. Sometimes they happen for no reason at all. After hearing this, I felt much less alone and it felt good to talk. Scientists have found exercise can help when you're feeling low. So our head of year encouraged me to sign up to the school football club, which Sasha was already in. I still have days when the river is there. But now I'm beginning to understand my mental health. I'm learning how to cope. Our head of year reminded me that my friends, family, teachers and lots of others at school are there to help just as much as he is. I had no idea the people around me could be so understanding. And while it's not always easy to talk about my mental health, the person I'm talking to might be able to help. If you don't feel like talking, that's fine. You could try writing, sports, reading, art, music, playing with your pet, whatever makes you feel better. 
If you're the person someone talks to when they're struggling, just listen with no pressure or judgment. You don't have to have the answer. If you feel unsure about anything, you can speak to a trusted adult. Talking about mental health doesn't have to be difficult. After all, it's something we all have. I love that video because it's um, the main takeaway that I always like to tell parents when I'm doing these trainings is that it takes a team to help our students through these uh, anxious feelings and overwhelming feelings. So it's really important to keep that in mind as we uh, moving as we move forward. So we know that there are some risk factors that put people at higher risk of poor mental health. Just because you have these in your life doesn't automatically mean that you'll have poor mental health, but these are just the um, risk factors that kind of heighten that. So we know that poverty is a big factor, any family conflict, so students who are exposed to frequent arguments, divorce or separation and domestic violence are at higher risk of poor mental health, any students dealing with social rejection, that includes bullying, that also includes students who may be resistant to going to school or afraid to go to school because of awkward social situations, they might have come across as their teacher as rude when they really didn't. They may have had some issues with um, communicating with a peer that didn't go as didn't go the way that they wanted it to go. So we see a lot of uh, social rejection, rejection being a risk factor for poor mental health. Any major transition or changes, such as starting a new school, moving to a new home, any family changes like new babies, changes in routine, health issues, and academic transitions. So students who are going from middle school to high school, uh, that transition from kindergarten to first grade things like that. Any learning disabilities, so students really dislike being different from their peers. So a lot of times when they have these learning disabilities, um, we see higher risk of poor mental health. And then of course, any students who have experienced trauma, neglect, or loss of a loved one, grief. We know the risk factors now, but what is the one biggest obstacle preventing us from achieving good mental health? As you saw from that video, uh, feelings and overwhelming feelings. So sometimes when those overwhelming feelings take over, that becomes unmanaged stress. And unmanaged stress is often what stands in the way of good mental health. We do know that stress is a normal part of life. It serves a purpose by motivating us to get things done and to do our best. For example, feeling stress about a project or a test can motivate our children to study or knowing that they have to be in a car for school at a certain time in the morning can help them get ready faster in the morning. Stress can come from a variety of different places. For us adults, it can come from money problems, relationship issues, and job insecurity. Children experience stress too, but it's often caused by academic pressure, family pressure, or social pressures of like feeling disconnected, being left out, or being bullied. Although some stress is okay, too much stress can become overwhelming. And when we have too much stress, it can cause real problems for our minds and our bodies. So let's talk a bit about anxiety. Unmanaged stress can lead many of our students to develop anxiety. We know that unmanaged stress tends to, when it builds up in our bodies, it tends to lead to headaches and stomach aches. And if it gets really bad, it can lead to things like anxiety and depression. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on depression because um, I'll, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but just know that anxiety is an emotion characterized by feelings of worry, fear, and physical sensations in the body. It is a general term used to describe a feeling of extreme worry or unease. Occasionally, all of us feel anxious, but we see it very, we see it more in children. It's a natural and expected part of life. Think about it. Have you felt anxiety creep up when faced with making any important decisions in your life? Maybe you feel anxiety when you're trying to solve a problem or when you have a medical issue you have to face. When we face something difficult or if we face an unknown outcome, anxiety likes to turn that challenge, that unknown, into a potentially dangerous situation, and our body reacts to that dangerous situation. Although worry and unease are typical in children, persistent or extreme forms of fear or worry could be due to anxiety. When a child feels anxiety that lasts a long time and it prevents them from doing things like going to school or seeing friends, then it can become an anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorders are more than just temporary worry or fear, and having an anxiety disorder means anxiety does not go away, and it interferes with daily life like school, work, job performance, or your relationships. 
Anxiety and excuse me, anxiety in children and teenagers can manifest in various ways. Recognizing these signs early can help parents and educators provide the necessary support. And here are some common indicators that we're seeing across Contra Costa County. So of course, students who are experiencing anxiety, they avoid school. So we're seeing a great deal of students suffering from anxiety um, experience school avoidance. Somatic complaints, which I'll talk a little bit more in detail, but stomach aches and headaches. These students usually are intensely afraid of social or performance situations that involve unfamiliar people or being evaluated by others. Again, that unknown is a dangerous situation. That's what our anxiety does to us. So going into an uh, unfamiliar situation, it can be dangerous. It can feel dangerous for a lot of us with anxiety. Any serious distress and panic when separated from a parent or caregiver? Any withdrawal that you see from your children? So avoiding places, people, or situations? And any strong resistance to changes in routine? We know that stimming, which can include hand flapping, rocking back and forth, spinning, or repeating sounds or phrases, that's a big sign that we see with our students who have a hard time communicating that they're anxious. And then just know that children tend to stim for self-regulation, to express emotions, and to cope with their anxiety. We see aggressive behavior and defiant behavior. These students tend to feel irritable and upset. They have outbursts of anger. Anxiety may present itself as fear or worry, but it can also make children irritable and angry because of that unknown. We know that students who uh, deal with anxiety suffer higher rates of meltdowns or emotional outbursts. These young people do things to hurt themselves like head banging, scratching skin, or hand biting. And then these students are also, if we see changes in school and performance and poor grades. So if you have a student who had no issues attending school, but then there's a sudden, they don't wanna go to school, you see a dip in their grades, teachers are calling you and letting you know that's been a dip in or a severe change in uh, behaviors at the school. That's usually an indication that something's going on and they may be dealing with some anxious feelings. And finally, there's tense muscles. So what are your students and children feeling inside? Tense muscles, sweating, heart pounding, and difficulty sitting still. These students tend to have trouble concentrating and they complain of their mind going blank in certain situations because of that fear. These students feel fatigue or their outer energy to cope with things that are going on. And then there's an excessive worry and needing things to go per uh, perfectly. Anxiety can arise from a combination of various factors. Understanding these can help in identifying and addressing anxiety effectively. Here are some key causes and contributing factors to anxiety. So there are individual factors. So we know that anxiety disorders, again, if your student has been diagnosed with an uh, anxiety disorder, so that's generalized anxiety, GAD, a social anxiety disorder or panic disorder, is pretty self-explanatory. These students have higher rates of anx anxious feelings. Any students with learning disabilities, so we know that the struggles with reading, writing, or math can lead to frustration and anxiety about school performance and looking different than your peers in the classroom. Any social skills defic deficits, so any difficulty in social interactions can cause anxiety, especially in group settings or during unstructured times like recess. Recess and lunchtime can be very, very, very stressful for our young people. There's also environmental factors. So we all know bullying is a big issue. So both in-person and cyberbullying can significantly contribute to anxiety. Special education students may be more vulnerable to bullying due to perceived differences by their peers. There's family issues that contribute to anxiety. So stressful home environment, including parental conflict, financial difficulties, or trauma can exasperate anxiety, anxious feelings in our kids. There's academic pressures, so high expectations and pressure to perform well academic can be very overwhelming, especially for students who are already struggling with learning. And there are course school related factors, which include negative experiences with teachers or peers. This was a big one for me growing up. I had a lot of negative experiences with teachers and that just kept me from wanting to go to school. And my mom had the, my parents had the hardest time getting me to go to school because of the negative experiences that I had with teachers. So any past negative interactions can create a fear sim of similar experiences happening again. Overwhelming workload and excessive amount of homework or classwork can be daunting, leading to avoidance behaviors from our kids. 
Inadequate support services, so lack of appropriate accommodations or support services can leave students feel unsupported and anxious. I will share some resources to help you feel supported in this effort towards the end of the presentation so you're not feeling alone. And we also have health related factors that we see in students, which include chronic health conditions. So conditions such as asthma, diabetes or epilepsy can cause anxiety due to frequent absences and a need for medical attention. And then there's medication side effects. So some medications used to manage health conditions or behavioral issues can have side effects that contribute to anxiety. And other factors that we see very quickly, uh, community and societal factors. So exposure to traumatic events, whether at home or in the community can lead to heightened anxiety. And then of course, food and housing insecurity, basic needs not being met can create a constant state of stress and anxiety for a lot of our young people. When talking about anxiety triggers, it's important to know that children have a difficulty understanding and, and, ma oh, excuse me, and managing emotions. You might need to read your child's signals and work out what makes your child feel anxious or stressed. Some common triggers of anxiety that we see are changes in routine and changes in environment. So when your life is in flux, whether it's positive or negative change, it can lead children and teenagers to, to feel uncertain and anxious. Any unfamiliar social situation, so social anxiety can be very triggering for many people and an upcoming social event can lead to anxiety. We know that sensory sensitivities are a big problem. Uh, so overwhelming environments, some students may find bright light, the loud noises or strong smells in schools overwhelming. Th this sensory overload can cause significant stress and anxiety, making it very hard for them to focus and feel comfortable and safe at school. There's also fear of a particular situation, activity, or object. Let's say social situations. I said recess and lunch seems to be a hard time for a lot of our students. If there's fear of that time, fear of that uh, social interaction not going well, students tend to avoid school altogether to avoid that. Times of transition. So any changes in routine or environment, like moving from a quiet classroom to a noisy playground or lunchroom can be particularly change challenging for students. Then others may include medical concerns, like I talked about earlier. So worrying about health can be a major trigger for anxiety, especially if you have a history of medical challenges. And then we all know about this, our news and social media, scary things going on in the world, blasting at you 24 seven through a device that you have all the time can lead to anxiety. Also the comparison game that is often connected with social media use can make students feel like they're not measuring up to their peers. So that comparison game is a big trigger for anxiety for a lot of our students. So once you've worked out things that make your child feel anxious, you can figure out the best way to help them manage their anxiety. And these situations, this might include just helping your child learn and recognize what anxiety feels like. That's the first step and that's one of the most important steps. Children might need to learn what anxiety feels like in their body. For example, when your child feels anxious, their palms may get sweaty, their stomach may feel strange, their heart beats faster, and they may start flapping their hands. One example of how you can help identify these triggers is drawing an outline of a person's body. Inside the outline, help your child draw or write what happens in each part of the body when they feel scared or worried. Another thing you can do if your child has a trouble communicating, you can draw that outline of the body, then have them rank one through five, what happens when they're feeling a specific emotion. So one through five, is it uncomfortable in your chest? How do your hands feel? Are they sweaty? Giving, letting them just give you a one through five is an easy way to indicate how they're feeling um, in that particular area of their body. Encouraging your child to use relaxation and calming strategies. You can help your child learn way, ways to calm down when they start feeling anxious or stressed. These include counting slowly to 10, taking five deep breaths, running around the yard five times, looking at a collection of their favorite or special things, reading to them their favorite book, closing their eyes for a few moments, or just going to a quiet part of the house where no one's gonna be able to bother them. Practice, practice, practice. So getting your child to practice these strategies when they are calm, once they know the strategies well, you can gently guide your child to try them when they feel anxious. And visual tools are so important. They're so big. I love visual tools. So creating visual tools to help your child through anxious situations. If visual supports and social stories work well with your child, 
You could use these tools to help them prepare for situations that make them feel anxious. For example, something that I've seen in Pat previous trainings that has uh, worked is if your child gets an anxious when you drop them off at school, you could take photos of your child and what they'll be doing. So walking in the school gate, sitting in the classroom, doing their favorite activity that they might really enjoy. If they enjoy playing sports or being out there in recess, you can take pictures of that eating lunch and so on. Sometimes this usually takes some um, collaboration with the teachers to do these photos, but they tend to work. You could also take photos of what you'll be doing while you're not together, like driving home, grocery shopping or other chores. Try to keep this very boring so they don't feel like they're missing too much. And then finally, a clear picture of you coming to pick your child up would be important too, or a video that they can watch of you coming to pick them up so they can anticipate that happening at the end of the day. Giving your child opportunities to practice handling anxious situations, again, like I said, practicing, practicing, practicing is going to be really important. But allowing your child to practice handling anxious situations is essential because it helps build resilience and confidence. By facing their fears in controlled settings, children learn effective coping strategies, and this reduces their tendency to avoid anxiety-provoking situations. This practice enhances their emotional regulation and problem-solving skills making them better equipped to handle future challenges on their own without your guidance. So why are we talking so much about anxiety this morning? Studies have shown that anxiety was, is one of the primary underlying causes of school avoidance. We know that anxiety impacts our, school, our students' availability for learning because it's preventing them from coming to school at all. So what is school avoidance? What are we talking about? Some of you have, may have heard school refusal. Again, I like to use school avoidance. Uh, school avoidance is when a teenager refuses to attend school or has difficulty remaining in school the entire day. They're avoiding school due to multiple issues that we'll talk about in a second. School avoidance can range from being reluctant to go to school to not being able to leave home or go to school at all. It is important to note that school avoidance is not the same as truancy. While truancy involves deliberate defiance or avoidance, school avoidance is typically rooted in underlying anxiety or fear of stressful situations. It's essential for parents to understand that school avoidance is a serious issue that requires a careful attention and support. And just know school refusal is not a formal psychiatric diagnosis, it's a symptom of a larger problem. School avoidance can have a gradual onset. It can start with your, your child asking to stay home for a day. Oh, mom or dad, I have too much going on. I need a mental health day. And then we see this continue to build and build and build until parents have a problem on their hands that they didn't really anticipate. We tend to notice that school avoidance can lead to a, lower a lowered endurance for school. So students may want to come home early or they may be taking off one day a month these students have a harder time staying in school consistently. These students also may have difficulty concentrating and keeping up with work since they've missed so much time at school, and they may want to avoid school altogether or avoid days that may be real tough for them. School avoidance can become a vicious cycle. The longer a student is out of school, the more difficult it is for them to return. This can lead to negative outcomes and fewer opportunities for career successes as an adult, which I'll talk about when I talk about why attendance is so important for all ages of students. There are three types of anxiety that contribute to school avoidance. So school, and, and I'm not saying that if, I wanna make a note really quick, I'm not saying that if your child is avoiding school, they automatically have anxiety and anxiety disorder. We just know that we tend to see students who are avoiding school tend to have higher rates of anxiety. So this isn't just uh, a this or that. I just want to be very clear about that. So social anxiety and performance anxiety are closely linked, but I thought it would be helpful to separate them in this chart. So students, social anxiety can social anxiety can show up for students in various ways, such as being new to us, being new to a school, or not having many friends or a good social uh, group at that school. Simply just being around a lot of people can be stressful for a lot of our students feeling pressure to act or look a particular way, conflict with peers or a friend group, or maybe there is a really awkward social interaction that your student is or child is ruminating on and they can't really shake it and that's preventing them from going to school. 
any fear of being judged negatively by their classmates or their teachers will prevent them from coming to school as well. With performance anxiety, we tend to see students avoid school due to having to give a presentation in front of class. Test taking and academic pressures can be daunting for students with performance anxiety. This type of anxiety can happen in sports, music, or dance performances, as well as school. And this is also because students are feared of being judged negatively by their fears. You see that theme, right? That negative judgment keeps a lot of our students from coming to school. Finally, we know that separation anxiety plays a big role in school avoidance because students tend to worry about their parents' health and safety when at school are separated. New babies at home can play a role in increasing school avoidance or students or sick grandparents can play a role at, at increasing school avoidance or, um, with students because they want to be home to help. They don't want to miss anything during that day. We know that transition years are tough for students, specifically between the ages five to six as they come into elementary school and 10 to 11 as they transition into middle school. Students may have difficult time leaving their parents and family members that unknown of not knowing what's going on creates fear again. And then any prolonged goodbyes in the morning, these are all characteristics that we see from students who are dealing with separation anxiety. We believe that behavior usually has a function, that what this means is there's a reason why our children are acting a specific way. So why are our students avoiding school? What are, what's going on at school that's causing them not to come? Uh, students avoid school to stay away from objects or situations that make them feel unpleasant physical symptoms or general distress, we see a lot of that. So some examples include being on the school bus, walking in the hallways, being on the playground, being in the lunchroom and sitting in class and sitting in the classroom. These are all areas where we see heightened anxiety for students. And I know that sounds like all of school, but all of school can be very daunting for a lot of our young people. Uh, and the stress of not being able to do school work because of a learning difference or being severely behind in school. Uh, there's also maybe specific people that the child may feel comfortable uncomfortable around so they may be leaving let's say they have a teacher that they really like they really enjoy and then a substitute teacher comes in students may have a hard time regulating themselves once that substitute teacher comes in and they may have a hard time trusting that their, their regular teacher will come back we do see that sometimes students tend to avoid school to avoid social or evaluative situations that are painful to the child so these are school-related performance situations. Examples of this include tests, reading out loud in class, speaking or presenting in front of others, any athletic performances in the gym, the playground or recreational sports. So students also avoid school to receive attention from parent or significant others. So again, students may wanna stay home because when they stay home, they get more attention from parents. Their friends may be more often to call them to ask them what's going on. They like that attention that they're receiving from staying home. So we know that students are maybe staying at home to receive that extra attention from parent, grandparent, caretaker, whoever's in the house with them. And then finally, students may avoid school to obtain tangible rewards that staying home make that makes staying home more enjoyable or comfortable than going to school. For example, a child may be avoiding school because their social anxiety makes them feel distressed in school. They stay home because of this anxiety. And then they start to gain the positive rewards from staying home, like that safe cocoon-like feeling of isolating in their bedroom, right? So by understanding the underlying reasons behind school avoidance behavior, parents can better help their children overcome their fears and return to school successfully. There are many signs of school avoidance. And the big theme that I want you to know here is that a lot of the signs that you see in school avoidance are also signs that you're gonna see of young people experiencing anxiety. So these are some signs of school avoidance that you may be able to identify in your children. Some of these signs are dependent on age. Most of these apply to children from all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade. So starting with crying, I'm sure as parents, you have seen crying across the board from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. Maybe sometimes this looks like whining. Sometimes it can be a full on tantrum or meltdown. Sometimes it's arguing or refusing to leave the house and putting up a real big fight when it's time to leave the house. Some students may even hide under the bed covers thinking that you won't find them there. They may be unable to move at all or they'll just beg and plead with you not to go. Please don't take me to school. I don't wanna be there. Can I please stay home? And that's really hard for parents to say no when they get into that position. 
We know that this happens a lot in elementary school, but we do see it in our middle school and our high school students as well. Students may refuse to get out of the car once you once they already are at school. This can be so frustrating. You go through the morning procedures, you get them in the car, you drive, make that drive to school, and they just won't get out of the car. We see that a lot. And that's a, that's a sign of school avoidance. That's a sign that they're avoiding something at school. It can also look like clinging behavior. So maybe your child is hanging around you a bit more, physically clinging on to you, not wanting to leave your side at all. This is very typical in elementary school, especially, but it can also happen in other grade levels. We see students rely more on special interests, routines, and rituals to distract themselves from the anxiety that they may be experiencing. And again, like anxiety, students who are dealing with school avoidance tend to stim more often by either rocking, spinning, flapping their hands. Again, this is a way for them to address that anxiety that they may be feeling. And then the physical complaints is a big, 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 big one. Uh, this one happens across the board. I saw it all the time in Golden Gate. Um, I see it all that we hear staff talk about it all the time. What do we do to keep kids at school? So just know that the physical complaints are related to somatic symptoms. Somatic symptoms occur when you feel anxiety and you basically make yourself feel physical symptoms. These physical symptoms can be a headache, a stomach ache, or muscle pain. Students complain of these things thinking that they're sick, but really they're just feeling extremely nervous or anxious. If they do get to school, it can cause them to go to the nurse's office frequently. And you may get a call from the nurse every now and then saying that they have a stomach ache or headache. And really, it could be nerves and overwhelming feelings that they just can't, can't deal with at that time. We see a lot more middle and high schoolers text or call their parents to come and pick them up early. We see a lot of students texting their parents during class to come pick them up, saying they feel sick. We don't see this as much from our elementary schools since some of them don't have phones yet, but it is something that's increasing uh, across the board and contra across the county. Students may test, your, test boundaries with their parents. We see this across the board with all ages. You may see that your child is asking you for certain things that they don't typically ask for you, like letting them stay home or like having you come pick them up early or just trying to push boundaries with you. And when they don't get their way, this may result in moodiness or irritability. They may be talking back more, putting up a fight about things. Another aspect, big one that we see is young people have trouble sleeping. This is another sign to be aware of. Maybe your child is having trouble staying asleep during the night. They may be unable to fall asleep at all. In elementary school, this typically looks like them having nightmares or not wanting to leave their side before bed or wanting to stay up and coming into your room often, keeping you up as well. In middle or high school, they are probably staying up on their devices or tossing and turning. And again, this may be due to avoidance and anxiety that they may be feeling about going to school the next day. Again, that fear of the unknown, the unknown of school the next day is keeping them up at night. Some other things to be aware of really quickly, uh, students avoid their schoolwork or housework chores. They're just avoiding everything altogether. We tend to see these students just withdraw from life, maybe even making threats of self-harm. This can occur in all grades, but typically we see this in middle school and high school. And finally, our, these students are regularly missing classes. They're avoiding those classes, teachers or students that make them feel unpleasant. They're also refusing to participate in social and family activities because there's just so much anxiety that's overwhelming for them. And then lastly, 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 we tend to see an overwhelming fear about disappointing others from these students as well. The impact of school avoidance for students who receive special, edu service, special education services is very important to talk about. Students who tend to receive special education services tend to have higher number of absences related to medical and behavioral appointments. Those absences add to the burden for students who already struggle in school. Some absences cannot be helped, they just can't. There's no way around it. So it's important to limit the number of non-appointment related, related absences that our students are experiencing. So when discussing the topic of school avoidance, it's really important for us to talk about how important regular attendance is for our students. School avoidance leads to chronic absenteeism resulting from a child's refusal to attend school, remain in school for the entire day or both. Chronic absenteeism, absenteeism really quick just means that your child or teenager is missing at least 10% of days in school year for any reason, including excused or unexcused absences. And just know, I'm just going to go over these really quickly. Attendance is one of the most important indicators of student success. We like to think it's test scores, but studies have shown um, it really isn't. It's attendance. 
Only 17% of students who are chronically absent in both kindergarten and first grade were reading proficiently in the third grade. Students are more likely to succeed in academics when they attend school consistently. So we know by the sixth grade, chronic absent becomes a leading indicator that a student will drop out of school. School attendance is directly linked to graduation rates and access to college. A student who misses 10 days or more during a school year is 20% less likely to graduate from high school and 25 less likely to enroll in college if that's the path that they wanna take. And then chronic absence in high school predicts lower college persistence. So we know that school attendance, uh, so students who have higher attendance or lower attendance or chronic absence tend to drop out of college at a higher rate. And just know that school attendance can be linked to having success in the work setting. To continue about the importance of attendance at all ages, our students who are in preschool are learning vital pre-academic habits. They're learning how to go to school every day, building social skills, learning to share, learning to tolerate frustration and how to ask for help when they need it. We see from preschool, it's important for students to attend regularly to get that reinforcement of these skills and to build an understanding that they can do things that are hard. Students in elementary school are building a foundation of early academic skills as they move on to middle and high school. And then having good attendance in middle and high school will help those kids who decide to go to college be more successful in college and they'll be more successful as they transition to work. So what are some strategies? We're gonna move on to strategies you can use to support your child at home. And it all starts with preparing your child for the school day. Try to plan for a calm start to the day by establishing morning and evening routines. For example, get clothes, lunches, and backpacks ready the night before and get your child to shower or bathe in the evening if that's a possibility. Help your child stick to bed bedtime routines. It will be way easier to get your child to school if they're not tired. Use clear, calm statements to let your child know you expect them to go to school. Say when rather than if. For example, when you say, for example, you can say when you're at school tomorrow instead of saying if you make it to school tomorrow. Use direct statements that don't give your child a chance to say no. For example, it's time to get out of bed. There's not really leeway to say yes or no to that. Again, I'm not saying that your child is not going to put up a fight when you use that language, but Again, it's, it's important for us to try to use direct statements that don't give them a chance to say no. Ask your child what activities they like at school and talk about how they'll be able to do that with them at school. You can do this in the morning as you eat breakfast together on the car ride. You're really just setting that mindset for them that when they get to school, they'll be participating in art. They'll get to see their favorite IA, things like that. All these suggestions can help you establish your own routine once you establish your routine, it's important that you keep it the same every morning. Routine is key for children to feel secure. It creates consistency for them, which is important for kids of all ages. We do know that goodbye rituals can be very helpful. So creating a short and sweet goodbye plan to do each morning, this is important, especially for elementary level kids. If you don't have a consistent ritual in the morning, students will start to feel insecure. It's important to talk about your goodbye ritual with your child. This may look like walking them up to a certain point, giving them a hug or two, and then sending them on their way. Stick to the plan every morning. Again, consistency is key. If this is inconsistent, this may increase the anxiety for your child. Stay positive. I know this is easier said than done, but really your child is looking to you to model to them how they're feeling, what they're feeling. If your child sees you looking upset or anxious, it will only amplify their own feelings of fear. So it's really important that we help reassure them that school is not a scary place. Sometimes you just have to fake it until you make it. If you try to stay more positive about this, your child will feel more secure and better about attending school. And then in light with staying positive, just sunny thoughts, we encourage positive affirmations for everyone, including ourselves. Practice saying positive affirmations to your child, such as you are going to have a great day today, I know that you're nervous, but you are so brave and responsible for being here. You are recognizing and validating their feelings, and this can be very important for students who are dealing with school avoidance. And just a final random tip that we've seen work in some cases, if you can get someone, I know this is really difficult, but if you can get someone else to take your child to school, if possible, children often cope better with separation at home rather than at the school. 
So we talked a bit, a little bit about what to prepare for. And now these are things you can practice with your children in those situations when they are crying, throwing a tantrum, or outright refusing to go to school. These are strategies you can practice with them. And these are very similar to the strategies that you can use with your students when man or your children when managing anxiety. So starting with taking deep breaths, we forget sometimes how breathing really does help our bodies regulate themselves. Kids hear from their counselors all the time, their teachers all the time. This is a big thing we hear at all schools. Take a deep breath, do your belly breathing, put your hands on your belly, deep breath through your nose and out of your mouth. So hopefully they're aware and know how to engage in deep breathing exercises. However, there are a bunch of mental wellness apps out there for free and YouTube videos that will instruct you on how to conduct big breathing exercises with your child at home. I will give you a link to some resources towards the end of this presentation as well. We're getting there soon. Secondly, using a grounding activity. This is really big uh, for counselors at schools. This is related to mindfulness. There have been lots of research on mindfulness and how it can help with coping with overwhelming feelings and anxiety. Students may be able to calm their thoughts using their senses in the activity five, four, three, two, one. And how you do this is you ask your child to find five things that they can see, four things that they can touch or feel, three things that they can hear, two things that they can smell or taste, and one mindful breath to end it. Basically what this does is when students are having an overwhelming feeling or they're nervous about school, they're only focused on that feeling and they're often amplifying that feeling because they're giving all of their energy and attention to it. It's important to distract our brain with another activity. This can help them gain a sense of control. It's helping them take their mind off of that overwhelming feeling in order to calm down and to think clearly. When students aren't thinking clearly, it's a lot harder for them to regulate their emotions. Next is modeling positive self-talk to reframe their thoughts. This is, this is like where we talked about with sunny thoughts. We're basically reframing a negative statement into a positive. One, helping students to say things like, this is hard, but I can do this. I will try my best. I miss my mom, my dad, my nana, or my pop, but I know I will see them after school. When you hear your child making a negative thought or expression, you can change it into a positive one. It's important to recognize and validate what they're feeling, but give them the sunny side of things rather than letting them get into that vortex of negativity. And finally, giving them something comforting to help them stay calm. We see this more with elementary school students, but this can happen all across the grades. It can work for everyone. We can use, uh, we, again, like I said, we have seen this with our elementary school kids. They bring their parents' hair tie to school, um, anything, any sorts of anything from home that's a source of comfort from them. We like to encourage young people to bring that to school. If it's not distracting, sorry, I forgot. I always forget about that part. People are like, don't bring anything that's distracting to school. Um, so just continuing on, uh, when a child won't go to school, is attempting to treat it as a behavioral problem or simply ignore it and hope it goes away. But in looking ahead, we want to make sure that the core issues are being addressed. A huge part of that is communication between you and your child. I want to encourage you to talk to your child about the reasons they don't want to go to school. Asking them how they feel and listening to their responses without judgment is important. If your child has a hard time uh, speaking or a hard time identifying or talking about the problem, ask your child to rate each part of the school day. For example, the bus ride, the classroom, any specialist classes they may have, teachers or peers, recess and lunch breaks. You could use a picture for each part of the day. And you could, again, you could use the one for I don't like and five for I really like. Or if the one to five is too complicated, you can use a sad face or a smiley face, a thumbs down or a thumbs up. This is just really giving us an idea of what makes our students uncomfortable throughout the day. I spent a good amount of time earlier in this presentation explaining how to recognize and understand the different types of why your student might be anxious. And I come back to this now because understanding what is causing them to be anxious is going to be it's going to help us understand what strategy we will be using to help them. You want to acknowledge that you understand your child's concern about going to school. It's important to show your child that you understand their feelings about going to school. For example, you could say, I can see you're worried about school. I know it's hard. Your teacher and I and everyone that's working with you, we just want to understand what's happening so we can help you get back to enjoyable things at school like learning and your friends. If the problem is mainly about leaving home and ex explain and reassure your child that things will be okay. For example, you don't need to worry about Nana because I'm here to look after her. 
help them understand that challenges can be good for the mind and the body. This helps us grow and become stronger. We want to coach our kids to tell themselves that they can do this and they got this and their bodies will respond to that. It's really important for us to help children problem solve obstacles to leaving home or going to school, clearly define the issue, then brainstorm possible solutions, choosing the option that has the best possible outcome. Just know some children can struggle to think of alternative solutions to problems, so it's okay for you to come up with the solutions yourself. We really wanna make sure that we're compassionate. When we see the world through our children's eyes, we can appreciate how they perceive what is going on around them. We wanna ask ourselves, what is my child seeing? What are they hearing and what are they doing? This can help us become more compassionate and it will help them manage those big overwhelming emotions. Coaching your child to notice how their body feels when those emotions begin to bubble up will also be an important thing to do. Being able to name those emotions and being able to navigate that situation by choosing how to respond, it will be will better help students deal with their overwhelming feelings. Just really, cool. I'm gonna go through this real quick. I don't know how I am on time, but uh, additional, it's important to help create a sense of connectedness for our child. As much as we want our kids to attend school because they love math and English, oftentimes we see children wanna come to school because they feel connected. Mentorship programs like Big Brothers and Sisters can be a great, great way program to helping students get connected with others outside of home. We have seen schools also provide support buddies for some students at school. Again, that sense of connection will get, keep them uh, excited about going to school. It's really important to help support our children uh, build relationships. Moving on, it's important to make a commitment to be firm on school mornings when your children complain about their symptoms. The expe expectation is that they are going to school even if they are experiencing some symptoms. Then finally, we, we want to include your, children's, your child's school to learn more about possible interventions that your school may be able to be, help, may be able to help with, excuse me. So some things to avoid, uh, of course, not going to school is not an option. So parents must find ways to support their children while helping them get the education they need, but without making your child feel anxious um, or more nervous about going to school. The way to respond to your child's cool avoidance can impact their ability to cope with their feelings. So creating a positive and trusting relationship is gonna be key. So just here are some things to avoid, telling your child's friends or peers about their school anxiety, Letting one else in can be tricky. Again, it's really important to let the school in, but letting peers or friends in, again, this is a family matter, so we need to keep it within the family. Shaming or punishing your child for not going to school, we please wanna avoid this. Asking your student, do they wanna go to school? We aren't asking the student if they wanna go to school. This is not a discussion. The expectation is that the child is going to school. And again, this is not a discussion item. Making fun of your child or allowing siblings to make fun of your child for not going to school. I know none of us are in this room doing this, but it's a possibility. I just want to name it. And all of these things can lead to further anxiety. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to assume that this issue will work out on its own. Steps must be taken to remedy this issue as soon as possible. We do need to realize that everything isn't going to be perfect. It's not a one or done deal. We need to allow for this transition and keep in mind that communication will be key. School avoidance is a difficult behavior to break. You may see fluctuations of behaviors. Some days are great, other days appear to be getting worse. Praise and rewards are gonna be important when students attend school on those great days. For example, your child can, learn bonus, can earn bonus time on technology, a special outing with a parent to their favorite place or their favorite meal for dinner. Understanding, compassion, and firmness will be very important on those bad days. And just know that there are going to be days where it's more difficult than usual to get students to school. So we all know after a weekend, it's hard to go to work. So after a weekend, the Monday blues, or especially it's hard to get the kids to school after a holiday or an extended break. Any changes in family dynamics after an illness or if they're out for a few days because they're sick, and then any social changes with peers, and then any possible changes in school schedules. So if students have to stay out a couple of days because of smoke days, because of the fires, or and then we all know how COVID impacted our students. So try to make your school your home. So we do know that kids need to stay home when they're sick. We don't want anyone going to school when they're sick. We understand that, but it's important to make your home boring during school hours so that they don't accidentally, you don't accidentally reward your child for not going to school. This means little to no TV, video game, leisure activities, internet use, and so on. 
If your child is not at school, it should not be a vacation from school. I know this is hard, but no screen. I know we're, all of us are working, but it's really important that we try to regulate the screen time. No naps for sleeping in, no staying home. Or when you stay home, there's no outside activities. And then you have to attend to your schoolwork when you're home. Then you have to read. Screen time, sleeping, outings, all allow the child to continue to avoid feelings that keep them from school. Make sure any visitors during the day, like grandparents, know what you're doing so they don't accidentally make it too fun to be at school. And then get your child to do the work provided by school while at home. This will help to make sure your child doesn't fall behind. And then finally, our final portion of the day, uh, thank you for sticking with me, is working with the school. It's important to act quickly and sensitive, sensitively on signs that your child is refusing to go back to school. This will make it easier for your child to go back to school and getting back to school as soon as possible will help your child keep up with schoolwork and friendships. School avoidance is unlikely to go away on its own. The best way to support your child is to go back to school. The best way to support your child to go back to school and stay in school is by working as a team with your child, school staff, and any children, any child professionals that can help you as well. Regular communication with your child's school is key to helping school avoidance. Having an early conversation with your child's class or homeroom teacher education assistant, school counselor, or reaching out to Janine is really important. Letting them know that you're having problems getting your child to school and share what's happening. And it's really important to share what's happening with your child. School staff, parents, and students can develop a plan to ensure your child has access to what they need in that setting. Indiv individual education plans are gonna be extremely important in this process because they do give accommodations to students that will make them, that will help them get to school. The most important information you and your child can bring to the table when you're meeting with the school are these. So what are some strategies that are helpful to your child when he or she or they feels anxious at school? Identifying trusted adults in the school setting who can support your child. So who does your child really enjoy at school? Who do they feel safe at school? This can be your child's go-to person when they need a break or someone to trust in a school setting. Are there tools that your child feels comfortable accessing at school? Uh, that we can make available to him or her or they when needed. If your child feels overwhelmed by the school environment, there are practical things you can ask the school about. If your child has been off for school for a long time, could your child return to school gradually? For example, your child might be able to start with a shorter school day or just go in for their favorite subjects and build from there. Is there a quiet space where your child could go if they feel anxious or upset? Could your child use help cards? These are really big in our schools like Marcus. These are visual reminders to your child to ask for an adult for help when they need it. For example, your child could show it to a teacher when they need to go to a quiet space. These are usually color coded and are usually pretty, very inconspicuous. So it's not really noticeable. It's similar to raising a hand. Could your child arrive or leave before or after other children? Could your child take a favorite comfort object into school? And could your child do a special lunchtime activity that builds on their interest, that keeps them wanting to come to school. If nothing is working and you feel at the end of your rope, there are some things that I wanna to touch on real briefly. In some cases, it might be necessary to speak with a pediatrician. If your child is having a lot of physical symptoms, that is something we wanna to check to make sure that there's nothing else going on. If, if, if it's a severe anxiety disorder, contacting a mental health professional will be necessary. I will have some resources that in the next slide that you can use and I'll give you my phone number. Please call me and I can help you navigate mental health resources in Contra Costa. And then again, discuss with school further interventions to help students be successful in returning to school. Schools desperately want students to be back in school in attendance and they're always developing more interventions to help bring students back into schools. So I just wanna leave you with some resources. If you could just screenshot it, or what I can also do is I can give you a link to our website where a lot of these resources are available, but just know that 211 provides callers with information about referrals to human services. If you need help navigating any mental health programs, any Medicaid programs, counseling, or any education programs to kind of improve uh, your capacity for mental health, you can call 211, you can go to 211.org, I really, 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 I know I'm saying really a lot, want to stress the care parenting network, especially when we're working with developing IEPs to, uh, for these accommodations for students who may be dealing with anxiety. Just know that care families provide support for children ages zero to 22 with developmental disabilities, developmental delays, and special health care needs. 
They provide support for individual education plans, community resources and integration of support services. And they also offer emotional support in the form of one-on-one -on -one support, mentor support and support groups. And all services are free. Really wanna stress, if you take any pic uh, pictures of any resources today, please take a picture of the Care Parenting Network uh, careparentingnetwork.org gives you more information about their uh, services. And then you can always call for more information about their uh, services at that number on the screen right now. And then finally, there's Erica's Lighthouse. Erica's Lighthouse is free services. So if you're looking to expand your knowledge or if you're looking to find activities uh, to do at home to increase mental health awareness, uh, Erica's Lighthouse provides all kinds of free information. Um, I'm going, I encourage you to come to the Parents' as Teachers Conference in a couple of weeks. I'll be there and it's gonna be more about strategies that you can do at home. Uh, and it's very visual, very easy to do. And you can do it with all students, whether um, they could uh, express what's going on and if they can't express what's going on. And then finally, there's the Bright Life Kids app. Uh, this app provides a personalized support for California families with ages zero to 18. This app will allow you to receive free coaching for sleep issues, worry, social skills, and more. And then finally, thank you for listening to me for the last hour. I know I went through too, really fast, um, I left the wrong number in there. My area code is actually 925-942-3341, 925-942-3341. Please give me a call if you have any questions about this uh, presentation or if you want to um, learn more, if you want to have a conversation, we can. I'm always willing to um, talk to any parent who's uh, looking for any services. And then um, there's my email also. If you want to email me, um, if you feel more comfortable emailing than calling, feel free to always email me. Um, I'm in the office Monday through Friday. If I don't get to answer the phone right away, I'll be sure to get, get to you right away. Thank you. Now I'll stop sharing the screen. Sorry if I went over on time too. Oh, no, don't apologize. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your information, Edmund. Um, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, so if we can cover those kind of briefly. Um, the first one is, what are ways to ask the school staff to manage noise level while getting classmates recentered? My little brings up feeling uh, overwhelmed by hearing the teachers or subs efforts to have classmates to be not so loud. Yes, that makes sense. We see that a lot, especially in those classrooms that seem to be um more active than other classrooms. So I think in, I can't really speak because I don't work for West Contra Costa, but I know that accommodations that we've seen um, in the in other schools that we work with are as um, a lot of schools have wellness rooms. So if the student is feeling overwhelmed by the noises in the classroom, they can take a break and go to that wellness room in order to calm down. They can take their schoolwork there, um, teach. There's usually someone in that wellness room that can help them. Uh, it's really just bringing up this um, this issue with your teachers and an IEP so that they can find accommodations. I've seen schools do a really good job of trying to accommodate that. It can be difficult, but I just really encourage you to let your school know, uh, let Janine know, and then let Care Parenting Network know if you need an advocate to work with you to really uh, push that situation. I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry. Um, if you need more, just let me know. Okay, and then um, another question is for a high school student, when we start seeing some avoidance indicators, who do we contact, counselor or principal? I, is there someone in West Contra that can, I, I don't wanna speak for West Contra, but I, I know um, in, in my experience, it's usually the, um, the counselor on um, campus. I know a lot of principals are really impacted. I do know West Contra has a really great special education team. So I, I please don't, I don't know if I can say this, but reach out to one of them on the special education team and then they can help navigate um, that issue. But I highly recommend reaching out to a mental health provider that you have at your school. Principals have a lot going on. They may not be able to get to you right away. But thank you. I do agree that um, in addition to contacting the special education department folks, it's good to let um, folks at your school site know as well. And a counselor is a good place to start. And then... Um, Let's see, there was one more, I'm sorry. A uh, couple more. Um, does school district have counselors? Uh, yeah, so does school districts have counselors for grief counseling at all school sites? Hmm. Um, I, I don't think so, um, but what we can do is we have a, a Contra Costa Office of Education has a really close partnership with Contra Costa Crisis Center. 
Contra Costa Crisis Center um, in the past. So for example, Pinole had an issue last year. Uh, we were able to connect Pinole with Contra Costa Crisis Center and they came out and did grief counseling for students. Um, there's also some um, different programs in the area like A3 who can provide grief counseling for your students and your child. If that's something that you're looking for, I highly advise you to give me a call and I can help you navigate those resources. Okay. Um, let's see. And uh, let's see, uh, in the example of gradual return to school, how would that be formalized with the school? Is this something that would be built into an IEP as an accommodation? Um, well, I can answer that. It certainly can be. Um, it certainly can be built into, um, into the IEP. Um, okay, going through here. Um, and then we, we did sort of answer this already. The district, does the district have counselors, social workers? Oh, at the elementary level. And does it require an IEP to receive counseling? Uh, so, um, generally it is, um, a, a counseling is added to a, uh, an IEP as a district service can be. So yes. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. And ERMS, um, I see the question about ERMS. Um, the district, ERMS is provided at, um, at the district level. So every school can access ERMS um, for students who, uh, who need it. And just to clarify, ERMS is educationally relevant um, mental health services. Um, and as, like, like Janine said, they're available across the district. Also, it is a service that can be added to an IEP. Um, it, it is not required to be on an IEP for a student to receive uh, mental health supports though. Right. Okay, and Edmund did put his uh, email and his phone number in the chat. I thank you so much, Edmund. Um, Thank you. It was great information, and we're really happy to have you. And folks, uh, you know that you will be able to access this presentation online on, on our website going forward. Okay. Thank you for having me. Have a good one. Thank you.